Hi everybody and welcome to my Facebook Live. Today, uh, my name is Dr. Sally Foote and I am a veterinarian with over 35 years of general veterinary practice experience and also a uh, niche behavior practice in veterinary behavior. Uh, I do a lot of speaking, writing um, about low stress handling, fear-free techniques and concepts, as well as providing behavior consults by telehealth to any veterinary practice and any uh, pet owner uh, in the United States and elsewhere. So today's topic that I want to talk about is how pain can increase aggression. I'm going to focus on dogs today. Okay, we also see this problem in cats, but for today's Facebook presentation, I'm going to focus on dogs. So I thought about this based actually on a couple of recent uh, behavior consults that I've had where there was a pain component for the animal, whether it was inflamed skin, an orthopedic disease, uh, intestinal you know, inflammation, but there was a pain component going on for in the animal's body, in the dog's body, that was definitely a part of the triggering up for increasing aggression in the dog. So while I've talked in the past at times about um, when there's pain and inflammation in the body, there are changes biochemically and physiologically in some of the neurotransmitters. We do get an increase in some of the stress hormones. We see a decrease in serotonin because serotonin is an important chemical in the body for helping to self-manage and reduce uh, pain perception and modulate that. But what I was really thinking about last night is why is there that delay in diagnostics and care when these animals have pain? Now what I'm talking about is really more about these dogs that may have a chronic source of pain. So maybe they chronically have irritated skin and it kind of comes and it goes, you know, it gets inflamed sometimes and it's not so bad at other times. Or maybe they have uh, early hip dysplasia, orthopedic disease, or maybe a past injury. They were hit by a car three years ago. They got up, they've been running around. So not much thought is given to the fact that there may be any source of now, inflammation three years later from that hit by car injury, from getting kicked by a horse, falling out of a truck, you know, whatever, um, yet that that might be going on in the body and aggravating things. So typically what we're going to see when there's some kind of a pain component, and when I'm talking about this pain component, I'm talking about on a scale of one to ten, this animal may be at about a five, a six to a five. Well, I'm not talking about the animal that is limping, holding the leg up, stopped eating, you know, crying in pain. That's a 10 out of 10. Okay, that's a high level of pain. And it's easy to, I think, for us to understand how an animal may suddenly lash out and bite at you if you try to pick this animal up or handle this animal. A lot of bodyguarding, and they're obviously in a high state of distress. I'm talking about the animal that's able to like get around, you know, and able to get up and move around, yet, they have that slow burn of chronic inflammation in their body, and there may be points in the day where that pain has spiked up. So what we tend to see is that there's a sudden increase in aggression or a relapse. They, maybe they were like a dog who would react and lunge at new people walking in the home, or especially with the owner. Maybe if the owner tried to wipe the feet, the dog was flipping the head and trying to bite them, and we improved that you know, with desensitization, counter conditioning, and behavior modification plan. So life has been going pretty well, but now all of a sudden he's flipping his head to bite at the owner again. So we either have a sudden increase of an animal who maybe has been a little bit aggressive and now he's more aggressive, or he's improved, but he's falling back. He's going back to some old behaviors. So that's typically what you're going to see, and, it, and it's going to happen like in a day or maybe a week. Your client's going to see this, a marked increase. But still, in the mark to increase, it's, un, it's not common, for, in my experience, and when I hear from other vets as well, it is not common for the client to immediately call, say, the veterinary office or contact the veterinary office somehow and say, you know, he is now growling more or snapping more. Uh, he's going back to, you know, biting when I wipe his feet. Do you think something might be wrong with him physically? Something painful, something health-wise? That is not common for the client to bring it up. And so why might that be? And I 
okay, this is what I thought about because this is, this is part of the history, you know, that I get or the situation, this is how it is. So there's a delay in getting the diagnostics done and there's a delay in presenting for care. So of course then these behaviors are going to go on. All right, so first of all, why would, why would people not call the vet? Why would they not think to call us? All right, number one, and this affects both the veterinary staff and the owner. Both of us have, have this problem, if you will, or this trouble that we now are going to have to try to examine an animal who's aggressed on us during examinations. Or they're, they, they uh, maybe, or they're panicking, right? They're struggling, they're climbing up your shoulders. They're very difficult to examine. And so now if they're more aggressive at home, of course the client's gonna think like, oh great, now I have to take them to the veterinarian. It's gonna be difficult. Um, and the veterinary staff may not be the most, hey, we can get them any time. Maybe, like, oh no, here comes the difficult 135 pound St. Bernard to come in for exam. Um, so there's handling exam and handling stress all to begin with. Maybe the animal has counter condition. Maybe they've improved. Maybe we've done the happy vet visits. Yet now, if he's more aggressive at home, we know he's going to be more aggressive coming into the vet office because we're going to have to touch them and we're going to be triggering them. So that's one delay. It was kind of a natural delay, I think, for the owner. Like, oh, I really have to bring him in. And even for us a little bit with the veterinary staff to be like, Maybe we should try a few things at home before we have to have them come in. All right, honestly, that's the truth of it, right? Especially if we're really busy. Uh, if we have the handling plan for this animal or we know, okay, he's going to need pre-medication, like we're going to need to give dispense trazodone, trazodone and gabapentin before we even try to bring him in, good. Okay, think ahead to that, of course. And, and then we need to have our client willing and wanting to give this. But... This is, I'm just saying it out loud, folks. This is one of the reasons why there is a delay. Why are we going to wait it out? Why are we going to try to see if we can kind of fix it with the things we did before with behavior, okay? That we're human, that this is, this is our nature of what we do. But let's, let's, let's identify this as one of the reasons why there may be a limit or delay on coming in for care. So the handling of this animal that's aggressive and in, that is painful, that's going to affect the veterinary staff. We better have some have our veterinary staff, assistants, technicians, and veterinarians have those skills for advanced, less stressful veterinary care handling and know the cocktails for pre-medication based upon this animal's, you know, previous behaviors coming into the veterinary office as well as consideration for pain. Always consider pain, please. So that affects the veterinarian and the owner. So B for vet, O for owner, okay? Second thing, Second reason, why would there be a delay in bringing this animal in? Well, first of all, you know, yes, maybe this 135, sorry, 135 pound St. Bernard's gonna be my example here. This 135 pound St. Bernard, when he was adopted through the rescue, may have, in coming into the new home, been a dog that if you even started to walk toward the dog would growl at you. And if you touched his back or touched his hip would immediately flip his head, that head flip. And, by desensitizing, counter conditioning, putting him on fluoxetine, maybe even on gabapentin as something to facilitate the fluoxetine and also happen to manage pain. Over the last two years of owning this wonderful Saint, the Saint Bernard, he has now improved in his behavior. He's decreased his reactivity. He's accepting touch from the owner. And we've even weaned down on some of these meds, okay? But that same dog, if you walk toward the dog, may lower his head may kind of crouch his body down, accept one or two touches, then turn to walk away. So that St. Bernard is showing anxiety. He's still anxious about the handling. He's anxious about the touch as triggers, for example. And the client said, well, that's okay. He's not trying to lunge and bite us, so that's okay. So they've normalized this level of anxiety. They don't see the anxiety anymore because it's like normal. And maybe they walk up to the dog to clip the leash on and he starts to growl in the moment of clipping the leash on and then once it's clipped and the owner takes a step back to go out through the door, the dog stops growling and growling is a level of aggression but never bites, never lunges up so eh, it's okay, it's just a growl. The client has normalized growling. The client has normalized maybe staring or stiffening up because they're only seeing the lunge bite 
as aggression. So this has been normalized. So when there's a popping up to go to now lunge bite, they're not surprised by it. The dog has done it before. They may be somewhat aware that, yeah, growl may lead to bite. He's growled before. So I guess today he's just kind of grouchy. Okay. Or if the dog is anxious, head down, ears down, and now he goes up to staring and growling, it might be like, oh, that's kind of weird. He's never done this before. But that's kind of just as much as the client thinks about it because it's not that much higher than the baseline the dog has always been showing. And so they don't see it as the real increase in anxiety or, and or aggression, and in this case, aggression, that it truly is. So the normalization of the aggression and anxiety by the owner is another reason for some delaying care. And they may just be like, well, we'll just need to do a few little things and he'll get better. Okay. And then, then it usually doesn't work out that way. And so then they finally, you know, will contact a trainer or a behaviorist, which is usually then the pathway, then it ultimately leads back to the veterinarian. Because many of our God bless you trainers and behaviorists out there that are not in the veterinary field, shelter care workers will often say like, you know, maybe he's got some pain somewhere that's aggravating this. Have you had a veterinary checkup? Have you talked to your veterinarian? Okay. But that normalization of aggression and anxiety, that's another reason for delay and seeking, you know, seeking some workup, seeking some care. Now, we can sometimes see a delay from the veterinary staff and really suggesting or promoting a full workup on what might possibly be a pain problem. In other words, this is the fifth time I've seen the St. Bernard with infected ears and, you know, I, I'm just like, okay, let's give him the sedative, clean the ears out, go ahead and put in uh, the Claro uh, infusion in the ears, send him home, I got other things to do. Okay, I'm sorry, it's, sometimes that is how it is. It's like, he just always gets ear infections. That we do, and if he's aggressive and difficult to treat, we may not really want to have to do the full, we may be thinking, oh, yeah, I've got to schedule the full sedation, et cetera. Um, so we may delay in care because of some of those things. But actually what we may be thinking of is, well, the Claro clears it up, his ears cleared up, it can't be pain. Yet, because we're comparing him to other cases, that when other dogs have their ears cleared up, they're not growling and snarling at the owner. So if he continues to growl and snarl at the owner, it has to be related to something in the home environment or just this dog's temperament. Whereas if we finally do say, no, nope, no, nope, we're really going to do the workup on this dog. We're going to run his blood work. We're going to check his thyroid level. We're going to run the, food, the allergy profile on him. Let's get him sedate. Let's really look down that ear canal, examine the eardrum, culture those ears and maybe even take a skull x-ray to see is there any evidence of um, inflammation in the bulla behind the ear and the bone, et cetera, to see is there a source of chronic head pain for this dog? Because even though the canal is healed, there may still be a source of pain in the body going on. And oftentimes you will find that, whoa, his thyroid's really low. That's why he keeps getting the chronic ear infections. So really to clear up the chronic ear infections is we need to get after that hypothyroidism. Oh, and we also have some food allergy. So, you know, we then really can do more to benefit these animals. But because we've compared them, they didn't look that bad to us. And compared to other dogs who have the same physical state, they're not aggressive. So we may sometimes make that assumption. Well, your, medic your physical state, you must not be in pain. But that's not necessarily true because what that and this animal's body is feeling and experiencing and biochemically what's going on is going to be individual. That while the ear canal may look clear, not inflamed, there still could be some residual pain going up the eighth cranial nerve or around, you know, that back bulla of the bone. That's not going to be evident on a physical examination. So, we need if veterinarians, I'm, I'm making a call out to us, okay? If the client says, he's just not right, he, yeah, his ears look better, but boy, he's still really grouchy. It never hurts to start pain relief medication and look for response to therapy, to start a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, 
to start something like gabapentin, even a very short term of a narcotic or a topical anesthetic. Acupuncture, that can be another treatment modality, pulse electromagnetic therapy, loop devices, um, or laser therapy. Okay, if we want to get out of the pharmaceutical side and go into some other alternative therapies. But the point being, even if well, everything looks clear to me, I don't see why this dog should be behaving this way. He should be free of pain, but he's still escalated up and he's aggressive. Use some kind of treat, pain relief treatment and have the client report back to you exactly, exactly the behaviors of the dog for what the triggers were, like somebody reaching to touch the head or approaching the dog, or is it resource guarding? And if you find, because you started uh, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory or he had an acupuncture treatment, that now the resource guarding has decreased or the, um, the dog is accepting handling and touch better, that's response to therapy, and that is an indication. That is a diagnostic tool. Yes, it's really nice, and we can get evidence through blood work, through you know an X-ray or ultrasound, and we ha we can actually put our fingers on that data. You know, we can actually measure it. Yet there's so often times things that are happening in the body that also affect the brain that we cannot get that hard data on, but we can see response to therapy, and response to therapy counts. So if we do see an improvement, let's use it. And secondly, bear in mind that whatever is happening in that animal's body is individual to that animal. Yes, we want to have some, you know, we, we use comparison like what well, typically healing goes this way. Yes, that is true. Yet, just because all other dogs with a clear ear canal are relieved of pain and acting fine does not necessarily mean that this dog with a clear looking ear canal is completely free of pain. So handling exam stress, uh, let's really get knowledgeable about our low stress handling skills, especially the advanced handling and aggressive handling. I, I have a lot of courses available for that. Uh, let's acknowledge that we may, our clients may be normalizing the aggression and anxiety. And then if a client says, well, he's okay, no. Paint me the picture of exactly what your dog looks like. Send me some photographs, send me some video. You know, we can do a quick telehealth consult uh, with our clients as part of this assessment so that you can assess what this animal looks like. Please do not just, because that's how it will decrease or eliminate this normalization that might be happening from the client in delaying care. And then lastly, let's be really careful about how we compare are the presentation in front of us to other past cases. Remember that every animal's experience is unique, and even if they look like they're standing straight up, especially in so many of these rescues, you take an x-ray on them, you're gonna see a lot of, past, you may see a lot of past trauma, you're gonna see buckshot in their back, you may see a healed old fracture, and that site may be creating inflammation in that area that's neuropathic, and, and will need and is part of contributing to the behavior problem. So thank you very much. I really appreciate everybody attending and scrolling in there. I will post this up on my YouTube channel, so subscribe to drsallyjfoot.com on YouTube. Um, I am doing more speaking. I will be at the Iowa State Veterinary Medical Association meeting with six hours of uh, presenting on low stress handling and also behavior of the pandemic. Uh, dogs and cats, our pandemic pet problems, amongst other topics. I will also be in Michigan in December, and I have started doing some of my on-road speaking through Boringer Ingelheim at the dinner meetings. I'll watch my website for announcement for some other um, events that I'll be having here at the Bella Behavior Learning Center. And take care, everybody. Stay safe and stay healthy. Bye-bye.